Good afternoon, everybody. The cameras are rolling. It's lovely to have you here. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. As ever, a real warm welcome to everyone who's here before me in Norcott, Georgia Street, and hello to everyone who's joining at home. Uh, it's a real delight to be collaborating again with, with colleagues in the Japanese Embassy. Ambassador Mariyama is here, and I'm going to hand over to him in a moment. But just again, it's been a real joy to work with you and your team. Uh, this is our second collaboration um, in, in, the, in the past year, in fact, so it's just really great to, to be keeping up these, these relations. We're going to hear from one of Ireland's most eminent diplomatic historians, Declan Downey, who's an expert in Japanese and European diplomatic history, will tell us about achieving compatibility of pacifism and self-protection, Japan's national defense strategy. Um, I'm thrilled that uh, a great friend of the Institute, John Neary, is going to be chairing. Thank you, John. I'm going to leave it to you in a moment to do the real honors. But before, I'm going to hand over to the ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this kind of introductions. And uh, please don't worry. I have this one, but I don't, I don't, I don't have any intention to make a long, long, long speech. So <laughs> leave me here. <laughs> I just want to say how I'm grateful to be here and uh, how I am uh, delighted to, uh, to have this opportunity uh, to have uh, Dr. Downey to tell us about the national, this uh, recent very interesting uh, development of the Japanese national security policies. And this national security policy is very interesting because of um, it's a comprehensive approach. When you talk about uh, security issues, we all immediately think about the article number nine of the uh, Japanese constitution for prohibiting to use the an offensive use of the, the force. But uh, national security um, strategy is, it, uh, we think about the comprehensive use of any kind of the force that we have, and on the top of this, diplomacy. So diplomacy combined together our economic strengths and of course, with a defensive capacity, make this strategy a very realistic one and very powerful one. You really are amazed to see a lot of new development that has been done during this and the, the, the presentation of Dr. Downey. So and we are talking about the uh, GDP and I'm talking about the uh, defense related GDP. We are now fixed uh, 2%. And as to an of the GNP in the 2027, but this is part of the strategy. But also, you will, you will see a lot of interesting de development. But, and please remind that the, our first prime and the, the first places of this strategy is diplomacy, to strengthen the diplomacy. And having the new strategy helps to strengthen our already active diplomacy. And we will continue to do so, combine both together may bring a little bit better word. And I'm quite sure that you will understand better. And uh, we see a very interesting and uh, lecture from Dr. Dan. Now, I would like to uh, invite John to, yes, you do uh, for your uh, remarks to uh, to make the presentation of Dr. Dan. Thank you, it was short, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador Mariyama. Um, I'd like to join Barry in welcoming you all here today to this event, which is being organized in conjunction with the Embassy of Japan in Ireland. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Declan Downey, who will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A with the audience. Uh, for those of you in the room, if you want to ask a question during the Q&A session, uh, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. And to those of you joining us online, um, you can, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, please feel free to send it in at any time during the session uh, using the Q&A function on uh, your screens. A reminder that today's presentation and Q&A session are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion uh, on Twitter or X using the handle at IIEA. So let me now formally introduce our guest speaker. Declan Downey is Assistant Professor in the School of History in University College Dublin. He was awarded a PhD in Legal and Diplomatic History from the University of Cambridge in 1993. Since 1995, he has been lecturing in European and Japanese diplomatic history 
at UCD, where he coordinates the BCL degree program in law with history. In 1995, he initiated the first ever Japanese history course at degree level in Ireland at UCD. A former trustee of the Chester Beatty, he is closely involved with Japanese cultural and academic events in Ireland. His extensive publications and leading role in major international research projects have been recognized with international distinctions and awards, including the Japanese Foreign Minister's Commendation in 2020. In autumn of 2022, Dr. Downey was the first Irish academic to be awarded the prestigious Gaimusho Visiting Scholarship, which he took up in Japan uh, last spring. So without further ado, I will hand the floor to Dr. Downey. Your Excellencies, members of the Institute of International and European Affairs, distinguished guests, I'm most appreciative of the honor to be invited to speak to you this day. And I should like to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to the Institute's Director General, Mr. Alex White, and to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Japan, Mr. Norio Maruyama, for their gracious invitation and hospitality. Also, I wish to thank Ms. Keiko Nakata, Dr. Barry Colfer, Mr. Kean Fitzgerald, for their discreet efficacy in organizing this event, and to Lorcan Malali, our tech wizard, who has uh, been very helpful to me this day. And finally, I wish to thank you, Emeritus Professor John Neary, for your kind remarks and for chairing my presentation. Achieving compatibility of pacifism and self-protection, Japan's national defense strategy. On the 16th of December, 2022, the Japanese government led by Prime Minister Kishida Fumio launched its new national defense policy called the National Security Strategy of Japan also known as the three strategic documents, which despite concerns to the contrary in some quarters has received considerable public support in Japan. Indeed, it has been greeted with relief among some of its neighbors too. Essentially, the policy states that due to the current serious threats to the international order, and the aggressive military activities of three neighboring countries, which it names, China, North Korea, and Russia, and the severity of the unprecedented strategic challenges that they now represent, not only to the international community, but also to Japan, the nation is embarking on a broad range of protective measures concerning security issues, the economy, cyberspace, and technology to preserve its interests. So how did this situation come to pass? And how is Japan balancing her pacifism with self-protection? So let us look at the historical and constitutional context. Japan, just like Ireland, is a small island nation, though with a much larger population density, off the coast of the great Eurasian landmass, which you see there on the map. It's a different perspective from what you're normally used to in terms of the world. Japan to the far east, Ireland to the far west, both countries have centuries-old cultures that are quite distinctive and deeply rooted in agriculture, yet both are modern high-tech societies open to global trade. In their respective national histories, both Japan and Ireland have had occasionally troubled relationships with their nearest and much larger neighbors. Since her independence in 1921, Ireland has maintained a policy of military neutrality and pacifism in foreign policy, 
And since the overthrow of General Tojo Hideki's militarist regime in 1945, Japan has also assiduously pursued a non-militaristic, pacifist, and humanitarian domestic and foreign policy. Unlike neutral Ireland, or neutral Austria, or neutral Switzerland, Japan, for constitutional reasons, does not even have a standing army, a navy, or an air force. So at this point, let us briefly refer to Article 9 of the Constitution of Japan and to two of the most noteworthy founding fathers of modern contemporary Japan, Shidehara Kijuro and Yoshida Shigeru. Now, on that slide, before I continue, just to give you that sense again of the strategic importance of Japan off the landmass of Asia, Ireland off the landmass of Europe. And then I have for your interest there two smaller images below them. One is a 16th century map, Spanish map, of Ireland's position in relation to Spain and Flanders' commercial interests. And the other map is a Russian map from 1904 relating to Japan's strategic position as the Russians considered it of South East Asia. But let us proceed. We can come back to the maps again in discussion. So here in slide four, you see the Japanese Diet receiving and presenting the new constitution to the emperor. And the smaller photograph is the image of the architect of that constitution, Shidehara Kijuro. He was a veteran diplomat and lifelong advocate of international pacifism, whom the Emperor Showa Hirohito appointed interim prime minister on the 9th of October, 1945. And his premiership lasted until the 22nd of May, 1946, during which time he oversaw the preparations for a general election and the drafting of the new constitution. It was his idea, and as scholars have recently established, his alone to propose the constitutional clause for the renunciation of war, what would become Article 9. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling international disputes. As Koseki Soichi and Ray Moore have demonstrated in their internationally acclaimed and prize-winning book, The Birth of Japan's Post-War Constitution, 1997, contrary to popular belief and the widely held misconception Neither President Harold Truman's administration nor General Douglas MacArthur's supreme command of the Allied powers imposed the new post-war constitution on Japan. For the purposes of this presentation, it is important to bear in mind three distinctive features in Article 9 of the Constitution. The absolute prohibition of the use of military aggression the prohibition on maintaining a full-strength standing army or other war potential, that's the quote, and the rejection of the right or claim to belligerence offensive warfare. So, the general election of 1946 swept the Liberal Democrat Party into power under its leader, Yoshida Shigeru who, like Shidehara, was also a veteran diplomat and opponent of militarism. Yoshida was prime minister from 1946 until 1954, except for a brief interlude from 47 to 48. It was a crucially important period for Japan's socioeconomic survival, stability, recovery, and growth. Yoshida worked closely with Shidehara, who was elected speaker of the lower house of the Diet or parliament, and he held that position until his death in 1951. 
So it is within the context of the communist Caesar of Eastern Europe in 1945, Mao's victory over the Kuomintang in China in 1949, and the Korean War from 1950 to 53, that Japan assumed vital importance to the USA's regional defense system in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. In his preparation for negotiations that would culminate in the formal ending of hostilities between Japan and the Allied powers in the Peace Treaty of San Francisco 1951, Yoshida appreciated this global situation and sought to gain advantages for Japan by following a strategy in a similar context that had been pursued by the French statesman Maurice de Talleyrand de Perigord in the aftermath of Napoleon Bonaparte's defeat and the Congress of Vienna in 1815. As the eminent Japanologist Kenneth B. Pyle observed that like Talleyrand, Yoshida would, quote, regain by diplomacy what had been lost by war, unquote. During negotiations, Yoshida came under pressure from John Foster Dulles and others to rearm Japan and to take a more active role in the US-led security system against the spread of communism in East and Southeast Asia. Yoshida was resolute in his consistent refusal of these demands and he asserted the Japanese constitution's renunciation of war. Instead, he insisted that Japan would contribute to the free world through constructive means of wealth creation, diplomacy, and humanitarian activity. However, realism required Japan to have some form of national security. So in 1954, the Japan Self-Defense Forces were established, but in strictly legal terms as an extension of the national police force. Most significantly, and keep this point in mind, the constitutional phrase war potential was defined as force that exceeds the basic minimum level for self-defense. Anything at or below that level does not have the potential for aggressive war and is therefore constitutionally compliant. Japan's Supreme Court has ruled that it is in the nation's basic and fundamental right to defend itself. The use of force to maintain internal security law and order is not prohibited by Article 9. Premier Yoshida's stance in 1951 with support from General MacArthur spared Japan the expense of war. And this allowed her to profit economically from supply orders to U.S. bases in Japan, Korea, and Indochina. Also, it helped assuage fears of a possible resurgence of Japanese militarism, both within Japan and abroad, especially among neighboring countries. It reassured the international community of Japan's pacifist sincerity and thereby generated goodwill towards Japan accessing international markets. Successive premiers to Yoshida were his disciples from the Yoshida Gakko or Yoshida School, such as Ikeda Hayato, the renowned Sato Aisaku, Tanaka Kakue, who initiated Sino-Japanese rapprochement, and Fukuda Yasuo. They presided over the strong political and economic recovery of Japan from the 60s right through to the end of the 70s, and the rise of contemporary Japan's status as a financial superpower with international influence and respect in the G7. As the strategist and former US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger observed, and I quote, Japanese decisions have been the most far-sighted and intelligent of any major nation in the post-war era. In 1955, Japan signed the Mutual Cooperation and Security Treaty with the USA. And like most of Europe, both NATO members and non-aligned, and some countries in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, Japan was content to rely upon the protection of the USA throughout the Cold War. 
During the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the combination of careful socioeconomic investment and innovation gave rise to the economic boom and immense prosperity of Japan during the 1980s and early 90s. Yet, ironically, the collapse of the Soviet bloc and the emergence of an apparent unipolarity in 1990, when Washington assumed the role of world policeman, stirred a sense of unease among the intelligent, perceptive, and questioning political and geostrategic observers in Tokyo, as indeed elsewhere. I'm referring to those who did not indulge in the groupthink or prevailing orthodoxy of the 90s and early 2000s, that globalization and free market capitalism would bring liberal democracy and civic society to the Russian Federation and to China. It is in this more recent and contemporary context that we can understand the gradual reinterpretation and transformation of Japan's national security policy. Ever since Japan began participating in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, in 1997, it has given its full support to the other member states and Japanese investment helped decisively in the composition and scale of ASEAN exports to the USA and to the EU. However, with increased economic and financial involvement with and assistance to ASEAN, successive Japanese governments have also been very careful to resist the concurrent pressure from both within ASEAN as well as from Washington, D.C., to assume a leading political leadership role. With the end of the Cold War in 1989, the decline of communism's international appeal, the disintegration of the USSR and the former Soviet bloc, and the loss of impetus for the non-aligned movement, it has become easier for Japan to emerge as a major player, not only economically, but also politically in the Pacific region. However, there was a reluctance in Japan itself to accept the USA's invitation to play a major international political role as befitted its leading economic power status. Much of this reluctance derives from Japanese public opinion, which demanded that Japan would only pursue pacifist and humanitarian objectives on the world stage and to avoid political and militaristic entanglements at the behest of the USA or any other superpower. Both premiers Nakasone Yasuhiro and Kaifu Toshiki were obliged to acquiesce in such public opinion as well as constitutional legal advice when they tried respectively to align Japan too closely with US military objectives regarding the Soviet Union in 1987 and in the first Gulf War in 1991. However, that is not to say that such anti-war sentiment in Japan blinded public opinion to the harsh realities of the world and the need for investment in Japan's self-defense. And here we look now at the gradual transformation of security consciousness among the Japanese. Japan's largest neighbor, the People's Republic of China, has emerged as a superpower to challenge the USA on the global stage. During the late 1980s and the 1990s, China had received a tremendous boost as the recipient of America's most favored nation trading status, and through foreign aid, loans, and investment, China thereby experienced unprecedented economic growth and as a consequence sufficient wealth to invest in its military and naval capabilities as well as nuclear weapons. Ironically, Japan was China's most generous benefactor. Indeed, when China was diplomatically isolated, albeit briefly, in the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre on the 4th of June, 1989. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, that event did happen, regardless of what some people are now trying to persuade us. It was the Japanese Prime Minister, Kaifu Toshiki, 
who ended Japan's participation in economic sanctions. He was the first leader of a major state to make an official visit to Beijing on the 10th of August, 1991. At that time, he reasoned that it would be better in the long run to help China's economic development and thereby engender better political and diplomatic relations, which he thought would inevitably lead to a political and social liberalization of China that would help the country transition peacefully and seamlessly from a one-party state to a democracy. Similar thinking had inspired Premier Hosokawa Morihiro and later Premier Abe Shinzo's friendly overtures towards the Russian Federation and with a view to obtaining the return of the Northern Territories to Japan. They had been seized and occupied by Moscow since early September 1945. However, Japanese goodwill towards China and Russia, as well as Tokyo's endeavors to engage Beijing and Moscow in friendly, constructive, and mutually cooperative dialogue, has not been fully reciprocated. The anti-Japanese demonstrations in Beijing in 2005 over the proposal from Brazil, India, and Germany that Japan be given a permanent seat on the UN Security Council did not occur spontaneously or without the approval of the Chinese Communist Party. Subsequently, in 2007, Premier Abe, alerted by Beijing's installation of medium and long-range ballistic missiles along China's coast aimed at Japan and other neighboring states, including the USA, and China's major investment ban uh, benefactors and trading partners being the object of this missile uh, installation. And the flag, point, the flag planting exercises that China has engaged upon on various rocks and islands beyond China's internationally recognized territorial waters. These events prompted him to initiate the quadrilateral security dialogue, known as the Quad, with India, Australia, and the USA, to cooperate and coordinate measures for their mutual security in the face of Chinese expansionism. Matters have not been improved by the series of joint Sino-Russian military and naval maneuvers in the South China Sea, the Sea of Japan, and in the North Pacific off the coast of Hokkaido since 2014, the year Putin annexed Crimea. And of course, there is the apparent unwillingness of either Xi or Putin and their regimes to rein in their useful irritant, the North Korean Kim hereditary dictatorship, whose missile launches into Japanese territory prompted Premier Abe's revision of Japan's national security, as well as his diplomatic strategy vis-a-vis -vis Beijing and Moscow. From the foregoing details, we can understand the context in which Abe's government enacted reforms in 2014 to allow Japan's self-defense forces to participate in collective security in the Pacific region. While his advocacy of amendments to Article 9 of the Constitution to strengthen Japan's capacity and capability for self-defense had drawn opposition from some quarters in Japanese society as threatening Japanese pacifism, interestingly, the opinion polls taken at the time indicated the wider public, about 73%, concurred with his argument for strengthening Japan's security, but to avoid direct confrontation with China, if at all possible. Following Australia's withdrawal from the Quad under its Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in 2008, it was suspended until 2017. Regional realities necessitated its renewal. 
especially after China's rejection of the International Permanent Court of Arbitration's ruling on the 12th of July 2016 that China had no historic rights or legal basis to claim sea areas inside the Nine Dash Line. These are contested islands in the South China Sea involving China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia and the Philippines. And also the court had ruled that China had breached its obligations on the international regulations for preventing collisions at sea and Article 94 of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea concerning maritime safety. So Premier Abe sought to provide consolidation of security through a mutual protective network with the aim of promoting greater economic exchange and security cooperation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2016. But this was opposed by both U.S. presidential candidates at that time, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Undaunted, and in the aftermath of North Korea's first successful hydrogen bomb test on the 3rd of September 2017, Premier Abe pressed ahead with the formation of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership in December 2018 with Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, Vietnam, and the USA. That same year, his government announced the acquisition of two Aegis Ashore batteries for missile defense. Within such actions, we can appreciate how Japan has balanced its pacifist and economic diplomacy with international cooperation for preserving stability and security in the Pacific Rim. Now, at this point, I'm just going to slightly digress here to draw your attention to the strategic maps. And this will explain to you in even greater detail the importance of Japan's strategy for self-defense. And it'll also raise questions for Europe and indeed for Ireland. Traditionally, we look at the world in this scene. And we think of Europe and Africa being at the center and Asia and the Americas on the peripheries. And there in Little Ireland, we think, ah, we're far away from all the trouble, all the theaters of operations. That's the traditional view. I also want to bring your attention here to the strategic straits for maritime trade. In the past, the imperial Western powers engaged in gunboat diplomacy in the 19th century, particularly to gain control of the straits. But over the last 25 years, China has been very clever buying up properties on the Straits. Most recently, they attempted to buy the Straits of Gibraltar, but the Spanish government blocked it. So think about control of trading routes. Now, there you have a map of the extent of China's missile ranges. And you will see there that the angle of the map is more polar, as in the North Pole. Ireland and Europe are not that far away. And look at the extent they can even reach the Americas with their missiles. And that is China. And we're supposed to be friendly trading countries with China, and yet they have aimed their missiles at us. Now, that is the map of the extent of North Korea's missile range. Rocket Man isn't just only focused on Japan and the South China Sea, ladies and gentlemen. His missile range can extend much further into Europe, including Ireland and most of the USA. 
want to go back to that again? We can come back to this in questions and answers. Now look at the geostrategic considerations, the Arctic Circle's significance. Let's see, let's see. to be the lights maybe basically what you're looking at here ladies and gentlemen you're looking down on the arctic circle and what you see there is the russian landmass and then extending into norway across to greenland over canada and alaska the Russian fleet at Arkhangelsk, ladies and gentlemen, as well as the Russian aircraft based there, came down from Arkhangelsk right through that clear passage between Iceland and Norway to the Irish coast. We are sitting ducks. When I used to go to Japan in the past, I used to fly over the Arctic Circle, and basically it was within 12 to 14 hours. But now we have to go a much longer distance, either through Doha or Abu Dhabi, or else across North America. You're talking about 22 to 24 hours. But that'll give you a sense of how fast one can move across the Arctic Circle into Northern Europe and especially the sea channels of Northwestern Europe, which are vital for the communication cables between America and Europe. And now we look at the Pacific Rim because China's immediate interest is in gaining control of not only trade, but everything else in the Pacific Rim. That, ladies and gentlemen, could well be the first theater of operations. Now, I'm not at liberty to mention his name, but a Japanese strategist very distinguished scholar in the field, mentioned to me that they expect that China could get rest of in the region about 2027. We need to be prepared. Especially in regards to what happens in the United States next November. So we come to dealing with the inescapable realities. Following Abe's premiership in 2020, his successor, the current Prime Minister Kishida Fumio, has been obliged by greater urgent necessity to upscale Japan's national security while simultaneously maintaining pacifism. And so in this regard, that he had hesitatingly took decisive measures and imposed sanctions on Russia immediately after Putin's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Also, the coincidence of Kishida's visit to Kiev in March of 23, at the same time as the Xi-Putin summit in Beijing, sent a very clear signal that Japan had taken a firm stand for the rules-based international order for decency and humanitarian values. At this point, it is worth bearing in mind that in 2022, North Korea launched 34 ballistic and cruise missiles into Japanese territorial waters and over Japan itself. On the 4th of October that year, the Kim dictatorship fired an intercontinental ballistic missile over Japan 
and Premier Kishida was obliged to warn his fellow citizens in Akita, Iwate, Okinawa, Hokkaido, and Aomori to take shelter. A month later, on the 2nd of November, North Korea launched a barrage of 23 ballistic and cruise missiles over the Sea of Japan all in one day. On the 18th of November, another of Pyongyang's unpleasant presence landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone. Therefore, it is no wonder that on the 16th of December 2022, Premier Kishida responded to such outrageous menace by announcing a new direction in Japan's national defense, the National Security Strategy, which he described as, quote, a major shift in Japan's security policy since World War II, unquote. That shift, ladies and gentlemen, includes a massive increase in the defense budget from 1% to 2% of GDP by the fiscal year 2027. It is unprecedented since 1938. And most significantly, Kishida announced Japan's right and capability for effective counter-strike. The three documents, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the National Defense Build-Up Plan, are worth reading. Regarding the Aegis anti-missile system, Technical and logistical difficulties with the Aegis Ashore system, first introduced into Japan in 2017, has led to the Japanese government's decision in December 2020 to adopt the Aegis Offshore system and build two Aegis-equipped vessels. However, the challenge this presented was the impossibility of protecting all of Japan from ballistic missiles every day of the year with only two Aegis destroyers at sea. More ships would be required. However, Premier Kishida's new security measures and updates to the ones since last year do not mention the abandonment or the replacement of Aegis ashore but they do refer to the new Aegis offshore vessels being increased in number to 12 and having integrated air defense and missile defense capability. As Ikeda Tohoru, the director of the National Security Institute at Fujitsu Defense and National Security Limited and a former vice admiral of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force has observed, this suggests two methods of deterring potential North Korean or Chinese missile attacks by seriously enhanced ballistic missile defenses, what we call denial deterrence, or by punitive countermeasures, the capability to counter strike. So the National Security Strategy document having acknowledged the increasing difficulty to merely defend alone against missile attacks, states, and I quote, for this reason, the Japanese self-defense force needs counter-strike capabilities, which in the case of missile attacks by an enemy, enable Japan to mount effective counter-strikes against the enemy to prevent further attacks. At the same time, Japanese forces should be defending the islands from incoming missiles by means of missile defense network. Here we see again, Japan is no longer leaving punitive deterrence to the USA as it had traditionally done since 1945. Such is the basic minimum level for self-defense nowadays that punitive deterrence is required. The Swiss have armed neutrality at the heart of their national defense. The Japanese now have armed pacifism. Indeed, 
given the current political extremities of bipartisanship in Washington's Capitol Hill and its paralyzing effect on America's ability to act decisively, a situation that has malingered since 2014, Japan's decision to assume greater responsibility for its national security capabilities is most wise. To further bolster Japan's capacity to defend its airspace, in February 23, Japan signed contracts for state-of-the-art fighter jets from Britain and Italy, while Spanish and Japanese naval engineers are cooperating in developing greater naval capacity. Also last November, Japan, India, and the Philippines formed a close strategic partnership for mutual security and economic progress. And in this arrangement, as in the previously mentioned Quad and the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, we can perceive what I would regard as a neo-Westphalian system being applied in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Rim orchestrated by Japan. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the renewal of the balance of power politics to keep the regional and potentially aggressive Leviathans, to invoke a Hobbesian concept, contained. That this has been achieved through a combination of strategic, economic, technological, diplomatic, and security cooperation for the purpose of maintaining general peace in the region is quite a significant achievement. There are lessons which the EU could learn from Japan's engagement with current global realpolitik, and particularly so for this island nation, Ireland, with its much vaunted pacifism and neutrality. The advice of the ancient Roman, Publius Flavius Renatus, still holds true to this day. Qui desiderat pacem, praeparet paret bellum. Those who desire peace should be prepared for war. As with armed neutrality, which has served and continues to serve Switzerland so well, we should not forget or dismiss the concept of armed pacifism either. At the outset of this presentation, I mentioned the negotiations of the San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1951. Premier Yoshida had resisted pressure to remilitarize Japan and to take on an active role in the US-led military strategy in East Asia during the Cold War. May I conclude with reference to the prescience of his explanation of his position to his aide, Miyazawa Kiichi, a future Prime Minister of Japan. And I quote Yoshida, the day for rearmament will come naturally when our livelihood recovers. It may sound devious, but let the Americans handle our security until then. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, an explanation of this remarkable transformation in Japan and how they are now facing the realities of the world. Thank you.